Uh, and that actually analyzes every file at the bit level. So if you imagine an electronic you know, language is ones and zeros, if even one one or one zero changes, uh, this checksum will alert us to that and we'll then know to go and restore a backup copy before it's too late. So it's not hopeless, uh, but it is complicated. It can be a major headache. Uh, and that's why I like to kind of <laughs> feature these two pictures here because it can be a headache. But it is important for us to think about our electronic records because uh, what we were talking about earlier while we were uh, on our tour at the museum that, you know, while that World War II exhibit is history to us, uh, one day the lives we're living through now is going to be history to somebody else. 50 years from now, and if we're not maintaining and preserving our lives, our experiences, uh, and our legacies, then people won't know what our life was like. And one of the best examples I can give you is um, we lived through a global pandemic, through COVID-19, uh, and I, through my own personal research, went back in time through the old Columbus newspapers uh, exploring the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, so just like that's history now, 50 years from now, people are going to, going to want to know what was COVID-19 like. Um, people are going to be researching, you know, the war in Ukraine. Uh, all of these things that we're living through is one day going to be history. Uh, and I think that's actually where I'll end it, is just encouraging you to, you to think about uh, you and your families and friends and anyone you know uh, what you have and making sure it's preserved so that one day we'll know about it. So if there's questions, I'm happy to answer anything you may have for them. Yes? How do you get the tape, you know, like you said, the tape that's turned and um, is there something you can use to get the tape off without destroying the picture. Yeah, so, so they make what's called micro spatulas. They're very tiny. Uh, and so that just gives you a little bit of an edge without actually being a knife uh, to wiggle it up underneath there. And once you get it started, in most cases, it'll peel right off. So it, it's actually easier than it looks uh, because that tape's going to dry up. And once you get a corner loose, in most cases, again, it's going to come right off. You're still stuck with the, the stain, but at least getting that tape off will stop it from staining further. Yes? I've got two questions for you. I'm old enough to go back to the period when we had slides. Uh -huh. But today, So phones, um, if you take it, some of this you can do at home. Uh, there are programs that will do this, or you can take it into the um, any number of other technology shops, whether it's the actual cell phone company or Best Buy or something like that. And they'll migrate it to your new phone. Uh, and so that's one way of keeping that. Uh, but that still doesn't really address the long-term life of it. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a really good answer to that. Uh, the only thing I can recommend is just making lots of copies of it. Uh, and you might make some thumb drives, you might make some CDs. And it's just an active process of keeping up with it. Every couple of years, you might want to make more copies so that it's on the latest technology. <coughs> or, I kind of hate to say this, but it's true, if you have some really important family photos or other electronic documents, print them out because those electronic records five ten fifteen years if you're lucky well paper will last thousands of years under the right circumstances thinking back to the old papyrus scrolls of ancient Egypt those 
really can last thousands of years. Where would one take paper, uh, paper-based collectible-type documents in our area? It's not, it's not necessary needs, necessarily need conservation, but it needs to be better than what it is now. <coughs> it needs to be preserved. I didn't get to tour the upstairs today, but I understand the upstairs is the Thomaston uh, local archive. You could try them. Uh, and, and it could be if they're like us. Uh, it, it could be if they're like us in Columbus, they may actually want to add it to their collections as a way of documenting the local lives and experiences. If not, for whatever reason, it's not appropriate for them to keep, or maybe you don't want them to keep it. Maybe it's something really special. Um, they, they should be equipped to help tell you what supplies to get uh, and how best to take care of it one way or the other. Yeah, it's more personal to like that. Yeah. Thing, so it needs to be better than what it is now, but it's not in bad shape. Yeah. I, I saw one in the back over there, yes. If you have a uh, all portrait, would you recommend putting glass over that? Well, I so art really isn't quite my expertise, but I think oil should be okay behind glass. Uh, I would want to double check that before I did it. Uh, but I think oil paintings will do okay behind glass, and uh, you would definitely want to look into what they just simply call museum glass. Uh, so if you go to a framer and tell them you want museum glass, they should know what you're talking about. But that did remind me there was one thing I left out. Uh, I, I, in previous research, I did find out that um, charcoal sketches uh, is one of the things you don't want to touch buffer or tissue paper because that buffer or tissue paper can rub up against the charcoal and actually blur or rub or even lift it off the paper. Uh, or roll it, yeah. I think I saw you in the back first. What about really, really old books and things like family Bibles? Is there, do you have any suggestions on how to store those or maybe to clean them? Yeah, so, so uh, storing them, I would put them in a box. Uh, and again, these boxes just act as barriers. Uh, they help keep it dark. Uh, so something like this, you can put um, your, your books in. Uh, if you can lay it flat, that's best. Uh, if you can't lay it flat, then laying the spine down would be the next best thing. So you don't really recommend displaying them on the shelf? Well, you could. You definitely could. Uh, and laying them flat, laying again, them is flat. best. Um, but I realize that's often problematic and can just create for odd arrangements. Uh, so if you can't lay it flat, then laying it upright you know, depending on its age, it might just be fine. When you say flat, you mean closed. Closed, yes. Now, one thing I read not that long ago is that rare book collectors, uh, these people who would have books going back hundreds and hundreds of years old, used to, as a ritual, every year they would oil their leather books. Uh, and that's fallen out of favor. They, they no longer recommend oiling your leather books anymore because that can alter its appearance. It can change its color. Uh, and the idea by oiling them is that you, you help keep them supple and so that they don't dry out. Uh, but as long as there's you know, a reasonable amount of humidity in the air, um, you know, that's not going to happen anyway. So they now recommend no longer doing that because it can, it can alter the original appearance of those leather covers. Yes? I have old um, camcorder videos of my children, you know, at Christmas time. What, what would be the best way to take those, because now you can't even watch them because the technology is not even there. What would you advise me to do to take those and put it on something where we can watch today. Yeah, so the best thing with that is to get it converted to a digital format, whether that's a DVD or just straight to the computer via the cloud or a thumb drive. 
Uh, and you'll, you'll still have those problems of all those other things I mentioned. Every five to ten years, you might want to upgrade it or make you know a, a newer copy. Uh, but getting it digitized is probably the best thing. Uh, and I don't know about it in Thomaston, but there's a vendor in Columbus who we've worked with uh, off and on. They're just called Columbus Tape and Video. And they can do that. They will do that for, uh, they're open to the general public. You don't require an appointment. Uh, you can just walk in and, and that's, you know, that's their business. That's what they do. Thank you. Yes. Speaking to that, if you've had something taken from a VHS tape and put on a DVD, but the quality is not that good because when the original VHS tape was made, lighting was not appropriate, actually. Uh, is there anything that they can do to improve the quality of the end product as far as what you see? So I haven't done that with the vendor I mentioned, Columbus Tape and Video. I imagine <laughs> they do have ways of enhancing or upgrading the original product. Uh, so I don't know if the Columbus one I mentioned will do that, uh, but there's one in Atlanta that can do that. Uh, they've changed companies. I think I remember their new name is the New South Preserve. I think that's their name. It used to be Crawford Media. Uh, they have a new, new name now, but they're in Atlanta. Uh, if they have all of that equipment and expertise to brighten, uh, adjust the sharpness, take out static, it's expensive, but they can they can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. What about rolls of photo negatives? Um, like at the PWS house where you viewed earlier, we have a small canister, a small metal canister, and it says "A Hundred Years in Rubber," and it's about the Goodrich Company, <clears throat> and. We don't know if it's ever been developed or not, and the can hasn't been opened, and we've been hesitant to open it because of any damage that we might cause. So what would we do? Where would we take that? And is there people that can handle that safely and possibly develop those photos? So we actually have an example of that in the Columbus State Archives as well. Uh, and I'll try to be brief, but we have a collection of a Columbus native. His name was John Craig. Uh, and he ended up being drafted and serving overseas during World War II. Uh, he was deployed to the Pacific Theater. Uh, and as his family told us, he was a pacifist. He didn't want to go fight. Uh, so what he did while overseas is he took that as an opportunity as a sort of cultural exchange. So he was an avid artist and photographer. And we have hundreds and hundreds of his sketches and photographs in Naples. We, and we have a film canister, uh, and it has a handwritten note on it that says, never develop. And we haven't developed it yet. We don't know what's on there. I guess eventually we probably will be brave and try and develop it. Uh, but, so that's a mystery. Uh, but that's a good question, because when that time comes, I don't know who I'll take that to. Uh, there are two different professional photographers that I work with, uh, and one of them, this question came up, uh, and he said that he no longer has a dark room, that, you, that he used to, but he, he got rid of it as, as technology changed. That's another thing that's gone by the wayside. Uh, so I wish I had a better answer for you. I would probably contact the people in Atlanta. Again, I think their latest name is the New South Preserve. If you just Google Atlanta archival film or some other combination of keywords, I'm sure they'll come up. Any others? One more, yes? Where's the best place to purchase the archival boxes? Oh, nobody's asked that yet. <laughs> so there's a few things. There's actually quite a lot you can get on Amazon. And most things, Amazon is way cheaper than the specialty vendors. Uh, for those occasional things you can't find on Amazon, or if you just want to be extra safe that you're getting the correct product, brand, or item number, uh, we at Columbus use Gaylord the most. And actually, you probably can't see it from where you're sitting, but Gaylord Archival is the picture I have there in the bottom right.
I think they're out of New York, but they're 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 online and they they ship everywhere, and they ship to you know home addresses. You don't have to be a a business to buy from them. You talking about freezing? What what is the process of freezing, and why do you? do that like what would that be used so for that's something i actually have never done yet but there is a process that goes into that uh, one reason you might want to freeze things is to get rid of bugs and so I, well, I we did talk about bugs tonight but <laughs> bugs can be a problem especially silverfish silverfish yeah, are really right. hard to get rid of as far as i know there's no bait that works on them <laughs> you just kind of have to trap them uh, or freeze them out uh, so if you have you know groups of documents maybe it's an old family bible uh, i think if i have this right and before you do this double check behind me but i think the best practice says to double bag it in a ziploc bag the heavy duty ziploc bags and so it's wrapped up really good um, and then I, I think you want to freeze it for a month because it takes time to kill not only the adults, but also the eggs. You want to get rid of the eggs, too. So I, I think you want to keep it frozen for a month. Uh, and then once you get it back out, find a way to slowly warm it back up. Because the other thing I didn't mention is not just that fluctuation, uh, but that condensation can form on it as well. And that water can do damage, too, if you're not careful. Yes? And what about damages from um, things like mold? I know you showed a picture with the book with a moldy, with moldy pages and things. And I know that you can control humidity to keep that from happening. But what if it's already damaged a book? How would you go about cleaning that so to my preserve My tricks it? for mold. I'm going to start off by a disclaimer that this is my personal philosophy and. Um, you know, if you do this and you have health problems, don't come to me. <laughs> but, you know, I one day realized that all of the advertisements and websites and other things you see about mold being deadly, they come from people selling you mold treatment services. <laughs> and yes, mold can aggravate and be, you know, unhealthy, but um, I feel like mold's not really as deadly as the mold treatment companies would like for you to think. Uh, so if you see something that's moldy, you might put a dust mask on, but I wouldn't run out and pay somebody $10,000 to come treat it for you. Uh, and so to answer your question, I would handle that one of two ways. If it's something that's on the margins, um, or if it's maybe on the cover of the book, something that's not text, uh, I would take an alcohol wipe and wipe it off, and that is going to kill the mold uh, and, as, you know, and, and treat it. Um, so, well, if it's something like this, where it's on the text and you don't want to risk running an alcohol wipe over the text, um, what I would, would do is either send it off to a professional to make sure that they get all the mold spores, uh, and what they do is they put it in an ozone chamber, and that ozone chamber kills all the spores. Because if you treat one page, well, you've got 30 other pages there that might be infected. So I would either bite the bullet and send it off to somebody to treat it, or if it's just a couple of pages, uh, and maybe it's not a book, maybe it's just a letter, you can scan it and keep the photocopy and then get rid of the moldy paper. So we, we occasionally do it that way. Yes? What about a family photograph from the 1800s that appears to be printed on glass? So uh, those can be really delicate, and those are especially prone to moisture damage. So uh, for sure, make sure those don't ever get wet. Uh, but other than kind of the general recommendations I've mentioned to keep things cool and dark, um, you could try and make a copy of it. Uh, because as that might fade, uh, you'll have a copy of it, uh, a digital, or you could print out a copy. Uh, and that will be one of your backups if the original fades. 
Uh, but other than those, I don't know if I have any other real specialty suggestions for class negatives. Just don't drop them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one more? I actually don't know how we're doing on time. One more, maybe? Okay. Well, if anything does ever come up, I'm happy to help. I've got some cards with me. Uh, and our hosts, I'm sure, know how to contact me. Uh, so thank you for having me. And, uh, of course, please, uh, if, you, if anything does come up, uh, for sure, please let me know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I will appreciate you. Thank you. For thank you. coming here. It was thank very you. good. I'm sure people are going to put some of this to you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. And stay in touch with you. I will. Thank you again for having me. And I was uh, telling some others this morning, this is my second time in Thomaston. My first and actually only experience in Thomaston was when a friend brought me to the historic Piggy Park. <laughs> so I'm glad to come back and I look forward to coming back again. Let me remind everyone we have our picnic.